I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swim Podcast. Joining me today is an athlete who needs no introduction. If you were swimming back in my day, this was this person was swimming royalty. You whispered her name on deck because she was the greatest of all time. 48 national titles, 63 American records, uh, five-time world champion, three-time Olympic gold medalist. Today we have Tracy Calkins. Melvin! Did I hit the metrics right at the beginning? I'll take it. You'll take it. <laughs> I, it's, here's, you know, here, let's, let's frame this. Um, if, if We have a lot of young listeners out there, and this is why I'm so thankful that you're coming on. And if you don't know Tracy Calkins, who is now Tracy Stockwell, which is another story, we'll get to it later. Um, shame on you. You need to know your swim history. This is the greatest swimmer of the 19, late 1970s and into the 80s. And um, it's, there's a lot of deep roots and deep stories. So 19, let's jump right into it. 1980 Olympic Games. I'm, I'm, in, I'm 10 years old, nine years old, just turning 11, excuse me. And my father, Big Melvin, is very, very bitter because there's the, the boycott. And the boycott was, it was a very depressing moment, but his entire emotion was wrapped up in, in you and oh. this being your moment. And uh, we were in North Carolina, and you were over there in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, I, did, did you feel that? Did you feel that from, from the fan base, from the community? Wow. Um, probably not. I think I was a little bit naive, and I think my parents protected me a lot from media and what was, you know, it's so different now with the media cycle. Um, and I just tried to stay focused. And my coach at the time, Don Talbot, really tried to just keep us all focused on um, the work we needed to do in the pool. Um, it was very disappointing, I guess, but I felt afterwards that fortunate that I was young enough you know, to have, four, you know, four more years. But at the time I thought, oh gosh, four more years, that's a long time. And I did lose a bit of motivation. Um, it was a disappointment and I can't believe Melvin, it was 40 years ago. I certainly, I can't be that old, but um, uh, you know, a real disappointment more for probably my friends who were on that 80 team and that we didn't get to go to the Olympics. And then four years later they tried and many of them just missed out as well. So I think that was probably more emotional and disappointing at the time. You know, it's funny in talking to athletes who were stars and who suffered at that time, it's almost like war. Everybody feels this guilt because some people made it through the shoot and made it to the 84 games and won. And those that didn't, I, I hear that same, I hear that story over oh, and over. Yeah. It's interesting. It, it, it is. It's, um, I I don't want to get too deep, but is was it was it is it something that's so traumatic that you would have to like actually have therapy over this? Was it was it something that you had did it did it stay with you for a long time? Look, I, I don't, and I never thought I needed therapy. However, I do think looking back, it did really um, hurt my motivation. And for two years, I didn't do a PB. I I was going through the motions. You know, I had achieved a lot and my dream was really to go to the Olympics. And when that was taking away, taken away, that opportunity, I guess, you know, I just kind of stalled and, you know, and, and uh, but about a year and a half out from the 84 trials, I really kind of said, hey, you know, this is your chance. And, and, you know, I was considered old at 21. You know, now people say, oh, how many Olympics did you go to? It's like, well, you're lucky if you get to one, you know, and many of us could have gone to two. I also kind of look back on it. So I think in that 80, 82, 83, I lost a bit of motivation and kind of was just going through the motions. Um, but now I look at it in hindsight, Perhaps it was a good thing because had I gone to 80 and done well, I might not have been motivated to go to 84, which soon after 84 is where I met my husband, Mark Stockwell. So my life could be totally different and I wouldn't be talking to you from Australia if 
perhaps if I went in 80. So I guess I, that makes me feel you know, a little bit better. So I don't, I don't believe you and I don't agree with you. I think that you would have done spectacularly well in 1980 and, and, and repeated in 84. So I don't buy that for a second, but that's just my opinion. For, so for folks listening there, you're, you're noticing a, a slight Australian accent and a slight Southern accent. Oh, and I'm that, confused. <laughs> and, and, and that is, and that uh, Tracy has been in Australia for how long? Longer than I was in America. So I just passed halfway. So I have lived in Australia um, 29 years. And, and, and I, left, I left America when I was 28. You, you married Mark Stockwell, and it's another story, but we'll, let's, let's get to that a little later. Yeah, okay, let's, no, let's, 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 let's back it up and so people know your history, because uh, 1972, you caught the Olympic bug. You caught the dream. Take me back to that moment. What, what was your moment when you went, aha, this is what I want to do? Yeah. Look, um, well, I started swimming at the encouragement of my older brother and sister just in the summer leagues, country club thing and I really didn't love it I was a skinny little child and um, I only liked to do backstroke because I didn't like to get my face wet and I liked to look around what was going on around me but by the end of the summer I flipped over and I learned the four strokes and my brother sister and I um, all were recruited to the year round the then AAU which is now USA Swimming um, uh, program um, which was Westside Victory which then became Nashville Aquatic Club um, and and I had been swimming for about a year and then the 72 Olympics were on TV and we were a big sporty family. We always loved watching the Olympics, especially the swimming. And I remember watching Mark Spitz win his seven gold medals. And I remember Shane Gould from Australia <clears throat> in her wattle togs and her stuffed kangaroo and gold and green you know, robe and, and I just kind of went, wow, wouldn't that be neat one day to, to be at the Olympics? And now I didn't know how you got there or anything, but um, it really did spark that dream of maybe one, you know, one day I could be there and probably the next year or two got a little bit more serious about swimming year round and, and thought, you know, hey, I'm pretty good at this. And um, if I work hard, you know, maybe that dream could come true one day. Unless your bio is wrong, you went to nationals the next year at 13. Is that correct? Now, you were nine and 72. By 13, yes. you went to U.S. nationals. Yes. 13 yes. at U.S. nationals, it seems like a child. Um, what was that experience like when you were on the big stage? Oh, uh, well... I was, I swam the 100 breaststroke. I was wide eyed and, you know, people I had read about in, you know, magazines and seen in the newspapers. And I was in the last heat of the 100 breaststroke in lane eight. You know, I think the American record holder was in lane four. I think I got 89th out of 90 swimmers and the person who got last actually got disqualified so I was actually the slowest person but my coach at the time Paul Bergen um, introduced me to a lot of Olympians and he had coached on the world championship team uh, two years a year or two earlier and um, introduced our team to some of those swimmers that you know, we, we, we thought we just were amazing. Um, but then you, you meet Bruce Furness and you think, wow, he's just a lovely, normal guy. And um, so that really, I think, was, was a great experience, even though I didn't swim particularly well. But at least by the end of it, I felt like I maybe I could belong here and fit in here and, um, you know, and, and get into the final maybe. This, was, this seems like, I mean, I, I, Don Schollander had a great 64 Olympics and uh, 68 with, with Mexico was certainly exciting. 72 was a, was a storied Olympics and 76 was a storied Olympics. So you came of age at a time when the Olympics was, was, was really a thing. It, like it, it, it's, uh, but it's, it's funny that in, in 76, you're, you're, you're coming online and it's happening for you. But your trajectory was fast. You made the na you made nationals at thirteen. By fourteen, you're at nationals, and I, and I did not know this. Fourteen, you set how many American records? You set, oh, I don't know, one or two. No. I don't know. I am, and maybe a breaststroke. Two hundred. Two hundred. Uh, yeah, you're, you're pressing my memory here. <laughs> so you said you. Yeah, it was pretty. Records. It was pretty quick. It was um, pretty quick trajectory, um, and but. 
we had an amazing program, made amazing teammates, um, you know, great coaching. Um, and again, I think that dream, you know, I just kept moving up and up and up and, and then, you know, the closer you get, the more you can feel it. And um, I think after the 76 nationals, um, I went on my first trip. It was a very small trip, um, ironically to Australia. Um, and there were a few Olympians because it was after the 76 Olympics. And um, I think my mother said she sent away a little girl and uh, a young woman came, came back. And, and I think that's what I remember so much about my swimming years are the, the trips and the people and the fun things that we did. It's not necessarily about, you know, the records or the medals and things, but it's those friendships and, and those opportunities to travel and, and see the world um, and open your eyes. So I did grow up a lot at that, at that, um, at that stage. And interestingly, you talk about the 76 Olympics. I think the East German women won every individual race except for one, which was won by a Russian breaststroker. And then at the world championships, two years later, they only won one um, individual race. And I think a bunch of 14, 15, 16 year old skinny girls thought, well, we're going to try to beat them anyway. You know, whatever, whatever we thought was happening um, behind the scenes. It's nice of you to say that, that records don't matter. And, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's like, it sounds like this, this part of your history is all truncated and it's still one little thumbnail in your brain. But your 78 World Championships was pretty, you know, it's pretty extraordinary. 15 years old. That year you won the James E. Sullivan Award. Youngest person ever to win it. And I don't think anyone's won it since at that age. Is this, is this, wow. no, it's, the, yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. So 1978, um, you won 400 IM, 200 IM, 200 fly. I made a note on this one and the, the, four, the, the medley relays, the four by one relay. So you could sprint. My understanding was like, I, that never that never made sense to me. So if you could do the 400 individual medley, but you even had a relay record once where you you let off in the 100 freestyle, and I I knew you could do all four events, but I didn't know you had that sort of a sprint gear. Mm. Probably I wasn't a drop dead sprinter. No, um, my sister would say she was, and she had a bit of you know quickness and natural quickness um so it you know i just knew if i i had good skills really good starts and turns and i knew i could finish better than anyone else so i might not have been ahead at the 25 or the 50 in a in a hundred but um you know i i liked my chances in the at the end there so um yeah naturally i would say i wasn't you know nowadays it's probably you've got a lot more um specialists um, swimmers and doing specialist events, but I loved doing all sorts of, of events, but mainly I think my, the 200 was probably my best distance 400 hurt quite a bit. And, and then the sprints, I really had to just work, work on, on getting that speed and nailing the, the skills. Was there an aha moment? Was there a moment where you're like, Whoa, uh, well, you realized how great you were. That's a bad question, but it's, uh, there is a moment in everyone's career where they go, wow, I'm really great at this. She's well, thinking. I think the, yeah, I know. I think the 78 world championships, I mean, were probably my best uh, competition ever. And, you know, I went in knowing I, I had a good chance of doing well and I expected to break some world records, but it was just such a great team environment and such a turnaround for the women in particular, um, for the U.S. women's team. And the attitude was just amazing. And those, you know, Sippy and Linda Yazik and Sterk and, uh, I mean, you know, Joan Pennington, they were all, you know, my friends and we were really tight and well, they still are my friends. And, and, uh, um, it would, that was probably my aha moment. But again, I swam almost every day of the competition and I, I don't know how I was so professional about it, but you know, and I didn't do well in one event. I missed the final in the 200 breaststroke and I just had to put that you know, behind me. And, um, you know, nowadays when they have to swim semis, you know, you, you, you couldn't do that program, um, when, when you had to do semifinals as well. So I would have had to probably pick a few and specialize, um, a little bit more, but I think that's when I kind of went, wow, you know, 
I'm doing it. I'm, you know, world champion, Sullivan Award winner. And a funny story about the Sullivan Award. One of my daughters, when she was younger, she was watching the Keeping Up with the Kardashians. And she said, they've got one of those trophies that we've got. So Bruce, Caitlin, had, you know, and, and she walked into the our sitting room where my Sullivan Award is. And she thought that was pretty cool that we were like the Kardashians. <laughs> you so like the Kardashians. <laughs> you, 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 you probably could have a, a, a keeping up with the Kardashians. It would be the keeping up with the Stockwells, and it, it might do well. I think it'd be pretty boring. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. There's never a dull moment with five children in the house and a very busy household and a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, so not now, not the moment. We're toing and froing, and they're growing up. So um, the house is a bit quieter. We have a nice organic role with your history up to 1980, but in, in terms of 1980, I, I, I experienced that moment as a kid, as a fan, the way most of us do, the way you did in, when you were nine in 1972. And I shared with what my, my dad felt, but looking back at your, at your metrics and seeing what your experience was, you know, you're, you're a little slack jawed because, uh, you know, we had this moment with Mark Spitz in 72 where he won seven goals. And then I'm, I'm looking at your, at your, at the, the data and you were, you were queued up to swim, to, to swim seven races because you would have had the two, the two additional ones with the, the relays. So we had a woman eight years later who was queued up with the potential to win, you know, seven medals, potentially seven goals. We don't know if that would have happened, but was that something that you thought about? Was that something that weighed on you? Look, I don't think I thought about it. And I think once we knew we weren't going to the 1980 Olympics, again, it was difficult to keep focus and motivation. But um, Don Talbot, we had lo our swim team in Nashville that summer was like the United Nations. We had Aussies, we had Kiwis, we had Canadians, we had Brits, we had Argentinians, we had people from all over. And one day, one country would say, we're going to Moscow, and the next day, so you'd be happy for them. The next day, Canada would say, well, we're going to join the U.S. in the boycott, and so you were sad for them. And um, But we tried to stay focused on the trials. But when I got to trials, which we had our trials after Moscow, and they put the three medal-winning times up on the scoreboard, and, like, I knew I was going to make the team in many events, um, I was pretty confident of that, but I was kind of focusing on those times and that pressure, I think, hindered my performances because the one event that I did do well in and broke an American record um, was the 200 IM, which at that time was not an Olympic event. And so there was no pressure and I did really well in that. And by the end of the meet, you know, they said, oh, you would have won, you know, five individual silver medals. So Mary T would have beat me in the butterfly. And I wouldn't have, I'd, I'd take that. I wouldn't have beat her. Um, but I think you kind of go, well, you don't know. If you were right next to somebody and, you know, and it was racing. I loved racing, loved competing. And, um, you know, would have given everything to, to get to the wall, my hand on the wall first. So you never know. And you know, I think I got over that, but um, it was it was a disappointing event for me because I felt like I wanted to try to prove that I, you know, might have have won gold and and broke world records. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as I said, you never knew if if you had actually been there. So we see this with all of our peers. We see this with 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 people who have breakout performances. We see people who are turned on at big competitions they start to perform well, they start to win. And then suddenly in an event where they shouldn't win, you should be very afraid of them. So that I, I think really that all falls under the, 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 the title of, of uh, momentum and momentum mm -hmm. matters at big events. And oh, uh, experience in 78. Yes. Big time, big time. It's uh, is this something, are, do, you, do you stay in touch and, and, and watch the performances of, of your peers, you know, in, in, after retired, after you retired? Back from way back when. Yeah, just, I mean, have you, have you stayed up with the Olympics, world-class swimming? Are you, is this something that you pay attention to? Well, I do try to keep in touch with what's going on now. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
or, or yeah, and, and great memories. And it's been interesting with this 40 year reunion or 40 years since Moscow. I hadn't really thought about it much until the calls came and there's virtual reunions, there's podcasts, there's, you know, and, and I'm talking to you now. And, and the first interview that I had, it was like, wow, you know, and, and I was kind of like, Oh, I can't remember, you know, you're really taking me back. But um, so I think I have moved on, but of course I still um, keep in touch and social media and, and I try to get to the golden goggles occasionally and get to some international meets. Um, I'm on the board of swimming Australia um, and so I've seen, you know, people and, and I probably know more of the coaches than, you know, and I keep try to keep up with the current athletes as well, but, um, and, and try to keep in touch with former teammates, which, cause we shared a lot and, um, you know, they're almost like your, your brothers and sisters and, and great teammates. And, you know, I enjoy catching up and following them. So I would have to say this, having witnessed a few of your golden goggle appearances, um, you definitely seem like someone who should have been in front of the camera. Uh, I would definitely, I've, I've had my biggest laughs at golden <laughs> goggles. And, and, uh, and I would say, you know, if there were three big laughs, two of those were at the expense of Rowdy Gaines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One of well, your peers. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, and, and on that topic, do you have you know do you have any story, any national team trip stories? Before we move into, uh, the, I, want, I want to touch on the '80s, but before we move into that, do you have any national team stories that are that you can share that might be? I don't want to, they, they don't have to be safe for work, but you know they could be on the edge. Anything funny? <laughs> well, there is a, a bit of a, a funny story it's at nationals in 1979. Um, I was getting ready to swim the 500 freestyle, which I normally did not, which was a new event for me. Very nervous. Stippy Woodhead, great mate, great friend, you know, respected competitor. And, and it was kind of the first time I'd ever swum a freestyle event, you know, at nationals other than on a relay. And before I went to the um, finals into the ready room um, route, I went to sit between the warm-up pool and the competition pool, just get my thoughts and rehearse my race as I would have done. And Rowdy's swimming um, in the warm-up pool and I kind of, he gets out of the pool and I, I nod and, or, or we, no, I didn't get out of the pool. He walked by and he nodded good luck. And, and um, so um, he takes off his tracksuit top, you know, and I think, oh, he's going to jump in the warm-up pool. And he takes down his tracksuit pants and he doesn't have his bathing suit on. And just at that stage, I look up, he's standing stark naked in front of me. And I'm like, I didn't know whether I should look, should I not look, you know? And about 10 minutes later, I went on to swim that five and a freestyle, um, won the event, broke the American record, which stood for 10 years until Janet Evans broke it. I always have to give Rowdy Gaines a little bit of the credit for getting me excited for that race. <laughs> but no, he's a, he's a great friend, and he actually he actually tells a different story and says that I said, "Oh, Rowdy, it's no big deal." But um, but we're great friends, and ironically, um, in the 1984 Olympics, it was Rowdy Gaines who defeated one Mark Stockwell from Australia. But I married Mark Stockwell, so you work it out. So, <laughs> so let, let, let's that, that, that's that. Yes, I knew that story, and I, I was hoping you would share it. Uh, you, but I wish you'd timed the punchline better. I didn't know that Rowdy added that it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so That's that, but, his, his side, but I don't remember him saying that, but he, he says that. So, so the, um, in, in, well, just, we, we can't, we can't hit on, on 1984. We have to, we have to talk about 83 in just one moment, especially for young swimmers or coaches out there. You, you talked about not being motivated and it really was crystallized in your 400 IM when you were five seconds off your best time. Uh, what's going on now? I know in hindsight, you're looking at it and saying, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm glad that happened then because I might not, have, I needed the motivation heading into 84, but where was your head at? Where were you when you're, when you're putting up a swim five seconds below your PB? Look, um, where was my head at? Probably not fully in the game, obviously. Um, I think I'd lost a little bit of strength. I wasn't training. I was training consistently, going through the motions, but I think I really wasn't, my heart and my head really weren't in it. And a funny thing about that 400 IM, I turned, at, I don't know, at the 100 or maybe halfway mark. 
and the um, I thought Kathleen Nord from East Germany was Petra Snyder. And I thought, oh, I'm doing all right. You know, I'm only just right at her shoulder. But then I pushed off into the breaststroke and there's Petra Snyder, you know, six seconds ahead of me. And, um, and you know, so I think just my belief, um, my motivation, but in hindsight, maybe it was the kick in the pants that I needed. But that was probably, um, yeah, 82, 83 the national team, we didn't really have great meets. Um, and, and, you know, and, and it's amazing what a team effort can do if one person's really charging the way and showing the belief that you can beat, you know, your competitors. Um, it sets up some good momentum for a team. So that's why I think that first day of an Olympics or World Championships is always really critical for a team to get off to a good start. Um, yeah, so, but it was probably the kick in the butt I needed to, you know, this, if I want to do anywhere near my best time, I need to, you know, get back to work and start, start focusing. And, and, and it did happen then. It did happen in 84. The, uh, it's hard. So for young kids out there, for young coaches out there, it's hard to explain the 1984 Olympics as we were rolling into the Olympics after 80, there was a lot of talk that the Olympics were in jeopardy. Like that was, was this viable? Was this viable as an economic enterprise? Was this, in 1984, the Los Angeles Olympics was the, the Olympics that supposedly saved the Olympic movement. And it was, yeah, special, think, it, it was a special Olympics. It was the Hollywood Olympics and they did it right. Did you have a sense of that living inside of that moment? Probably not. Um, well, leading into it, I think home games was just such a great opportunity because your family and friends could be there. The crowd, you know, really got behind you. The, the colors, the fanfare, um, you know, I think I didn't really realize what a great job Peter Uberoff and the organizing committee did till afterwards that they actually, you know, and you, it didn't seem like they, you know, cut spending, you know, but because it all looked amazing and was run really well. And, but now portable stands and, you know, temporary warm up pools and all these things that really kind of changed the way things were, but it was just, um, a dream come true to be able to compete and to compete in a home Olympics. I remember my first race on the first day, the 400 I am, I dove in, came up, you know, a foot or two ahead in the 400 I am. And the crowd was going crazy. I was like, I got so excited. And then I went, Whoa, 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 this is a 400 I am, you know, stick with your race plan. But um, I learned that, well, let's use this, you know, the energy from the crowd and um, to, to help get, get best times. There were a lot of great stories from the 1984 Olympic Games. There was the tying the 100 free with the women. Mm -hmm. There was the, uh, there was, there was some sad stories. There was Rick Carey who had a dominant performance and, and didn't react, didn't act for the camera. And, and uh, which is, you know, I respected him as a young athlete for, for his reaction. I, I knew that it was about personal best times. And, yeah. and there, was, there was the fact that it's like Tracy won her three gold medals. And that was a, this, that was a big story. Uh, Bruce Hayes coming home against oh, uh, amazing. Mike, yeah. My, yeah, in the 4 by 2 and free, uh, holding off Mike, the great Michael Gross, the albatross. And then there was the men's 100-meter freestyle. And I do think that you have an interesting point of view on this. I, now, I watched it with my father and my mother. And we, in the 100 meter freestyle, it, it appeared that, that Rowdy had a perfect start or a false start. And depending on who you talk to, there's their different opinions. But you yeah. married the man who probably would have won that race if everyone had started at the same time. Yeah, yeah. look, and I think... Um, enough analysis that has been done that Rowdy did not fall start, but um, the Panamanian starter just shot, they didn't let the whole field come down together. And it wasn't just Mark that was left on the blocks. Mike Heath, who was my teammate from Florida also. Um, so they were on either side, I think of Rowdy. Um, and no, oh, Rowdy was in lane three, Mark was in four and Mike was in lane five. And uh, Mike Heath's brother sent Mark a photograph of that start and you just look at it. Now, I didn't know Mark Stockwell at the time. I had met him through Aussies that I knew um, in the village. 
Um, Rowdy and I have been teammates since 77, 78, had gone through lots of ups and downs. And um, I remember before that final, he was quite nervous and somebody came to me and said, Tracy, I think you need to talk to Rowdy. I was one of the team captains and they knew I was close to him. And he was, he was worried. He, he, was, he was worried about what happens if I don't win. And I said, well, you know what, if you don't win, the sun will come up tomorrow. Your family will still love you. And I said, but you deserve to be here. And after what we've been through with the boycott and all the ups and downs we have been through, I said, this is your moment. Just enjoy it. And Mark tells me years later, he said in the post-race um, media conference, Rowdy gave me a bit of credit for settling him down and helping get him in the right mindset. And, you know, Mark's, Mark's like, who is this Tracy Calkins, you know, kind of thing. And we've had a lot of time together, Rowdy and Mark and I, and they've, 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 it's a special experience and it's a different, unique experience. And, you know, Mark often says, you know, the silver medal, it's kind of the one that everybody wants, but two people, you know, <laughs> the one that got it and the one that won the gold. And, and, um, you know, it took him a while to get over it because that was, you know, he was, the Aussies were swimming very well and he was swimming very well. Um, but he's, you know, he, he's dealt with it and I think it's helped him to get to know Rowdy over the years. And we've done a bit together, which has been really nice because we do share that, um, special experience. I remember, going to a Pan Pacific champ, Pan Pacific championship, not Pan Pacific games. Was it 87? It might've been 87. In it, Brisbane. In Brisbane. Did you, did you and Mark both were, were the announcers. Yes. Yeah. You were yeah. the announcers and you interviewed us live over the PA at, in our, as our post-race interview. Is that, that was correct, right? That's correct. Yes, that's right. No, we had a, a lot of fun with that. Yeah. That worked out well that I was in, in Brisbane and we both got to do that. Was so had the relationship started at that point, or was it? Oh yeah, you, oh yeah. You were you oh, were yeah. down the road already. Yeah, we were well down the road. So, <laughs> so, uh, but we did. It took us a while though to get married. But, um, and I say to my kids, that was before you know Skype and FaceTime, and you know we had to write letters and have expensive phone calls, and um, you know, um, but we made a real effort to try to see each other. Um, and I worked in Australia um many times and lived here for a year in 1988 to see if I could still um like him living in the same same city and but Mark had had time at Florida and that's really where we fell in love and then we did the back and forth back and forth and years later and almost 30 years married five children still going strong it works it must have worked we'll, we'll, we'll call that another gold medal I like, I like him yeah. That's Mark's goal. That's, that's Mark's. Goal. Yes, that's what Mark says. He said he had to marry one. So I say I got three three gold medals and, and a husband. So he's my booby prize. So the, the uh, if I remember correctly, was your last international trip for Team USA, the 1986 World Championships? Is that correct? No, no. I retired after 84. 84. I, where did I see you? So I, I went was... to Google Games. You did. And was doing television for TBS with oh my God. John, Nader, right. John Nader and yeah, that's probably it was you. It was it was Rowdy. Nancy, was, that Rowdy. Was my, okay, that was my first international. That was my first national team, and I was young and an idiot. And I remember, so if I remember the good the Goodwill Games, we were all went to Russia, and of course that's, before, that's that was the USSR is when before the wall came down, and Rowdy's lost his luggage, and he wore <laughs> John Neighbors. He had to wear John Neighbor's suit. He looked like a boy, like a 12-year-old boy wearing his daddy's Sunday church suit on camera. Correct? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. How, how was that experience for you? Well, it was, it was interesting to go to Moscow after six years prior, not having that opportunity to go. Um, and we did see a lot of the same festivities of that they re, you know, brought back from, from the 80 games. And I think it was the Olympic pool that the competition was in. Um, yeah, it, I think I had got over the disappointment of the boycott. And I suppose when you get to go four years later um, and do well and retire on your own terms, you, 
you know, it, I was lucky that I was settled with with my career. And, and so I, I enjoyed going and, and enjoyed seeing the city and enjoyed remaining involved with swimming and seeing new young kid, you and Janet Evans and, you know, a lot of young kids coming through that, you know, we, we thought, okay, USA Swimming is going to be doing all right. Janet's a peer and I absolutely love Janet, but Janet didn't have the Tracy Calkins gears. And that was, uh, you know, for forever. And I think for generations to come, Swim nerds are going to debate who is the greatest female swimmer of all time from age group records to the totality of their career. And your name is on a very, very short list. And from, you know, and most people you talk to, they're like, no, it's Tracy. Tracy's the one. And it, and it is, it's all the age group records. It's all the American records. You know, there's a certain point in time when you had, you, so you have 48 national titles, but you won 39 national titles, more than Johnny Weissmuller. And uh, I, I don't, I mean, it's just like when you're winning at that level, do you, do you just step on the blocks and think, I got this? Most of the time, most of the time I did. <laughs> I mean, you don't go in, you know, if you've got a bit of doubt. I mean, there were probably in 83, that maybe 82, 83 internationally, there was a little bit of doubt. But um, no, I think, um, yeah, it's about belief and about confidence and, and experience by that time, you know, I was well experienced as well. So, and I love swimming lots of different things. So, and I think um, I always worked on whatever was my weakness um, when I was focusing on the I am, because I think the 200 I am and 400 I am were probably my best events. And, you know, but, but what I loved about having so many events was in training, if one stroke wasn't going well, I could always, you know, do something else. And it was always helping my I am and stuff. So um, I loved doing lots of different races, different challenges, um, racing different people. When I, this is a weird question. I always look at swimmers bodies. I do. Uh, and, uh, and I, but I remember I, cause I, I, mean, I would study them yeah. and, uh, men and women, I, but I would study them and, it, and I, and I've studied you, but it's, uh, it's, we're going down a weird road right now, but it seemed, <laughs> okay. like, you, it seemed like you had hyper extended everything. And I've never quite seen that with anyone. Not that I didn't see it again, not that body type and in, in terms of the hyper extension until Michael Phelps. It, it, I don't know if anyone's ever said that to you. They have. Okay. Yeah. Other people have said that to me. They said, are you sure he's not your love child? <laughs> yeah, it is weird. It's like, it's like you really have all of the, the your body hyper extends in ways that are very unique. So let's, let's talk about the flexible ankles thing. How, how are you on? Cause it, I never, I've never seen you like pop down and show how flexible your ankles are. Are you, a, cause you swam breaststroke. Did you, do you have super flexible ankles? Yeah, but now I'm paying for it. I roll mean? my ankles all the time. <laughs> I'm not a good person on land, you know. I, um, but no, I have very flexible, hyperextended knees, elbows, you know, um, ankles. Yeah, we worked on our flexibility as well. And sometimes I go, do I really need to work on it more? You know, I'm kind of like, I'm already very flexible, um, which then as you get to me my age, you know, sometimes you've got to strengthen it to hold it all together. So, um, uh, yeah. Wobbly ankles, knees. How oh, funny. But it, yeah, I think it did help when, when I was swimming, that's for sure. Yeah, no, dude, but your body type is very, very similar to Michael's, and it's, uh, which is very unusual and, and speaks volumes. But uh, so in terms of all the athletes, I always ask everybody in, in, a, in, a, in as much awkward way as possible is to show me how flexible your ankles are. And I've done this with everyone. I've never done it with you. But if, I ever, if I'm ever around you in private and we're having a drink, I would. I did it. And, and, and uh, we were in some gang of uh, Olympians and everyone did it. And John neighbor had the most flexible ankles. It looked like his ankle had a, like the bone was broken in the top. Oh, mine's not. This. It was you weird. Know who, who I have seen Anne Ottenbright from Canada, who was breaststroker. She could stand like this and rotate her, you know, I almost turn her feet inside out and, it was yeah, a, bit, a little bit freaky looking. No, I'm not that flexible in my ankles, but knees and elbows, very hyperextended. And I have two daughters who are dancers, so they've got very good flexibility from their mother, but they've got different kind of strength yeah, from that. 
So we're, we're winding down to the end now. And I, and I guess the, so the winding down questions are this, you know, you, when you're, when you've achieved greatness and, you, and it, you've done it in the water, there's a certain point where you can't get back. A lot of people can't swim. They, they feel like they can't relax in the water and it takes years for them to do that. But there's a certain point when you can just jump in. It's like, I don't care. What was that point for you? Not still what this summer, this summer in Australia, still haven't done it. Mark swims two or three times a week, more for his head and his, you know, and I have done it a little bit, but I get in there and I think I can still remember what it's supposed to feel like. And because it doesn't feel like that, you know, it, it just feels a little bit odd. I, I work more on land and strength, but I think I am this summer, which is coming in Australia. Um, I am going to do some swimming. Mark still asks me often, do you want to come for a swim with me? I'm like, nah, I don't think so. So I, I hope the memory is far enough away where I can just get in and enjoy it. And I feel good for about 200 meters. And then after that, everything starts to fall apart. And I remember what it's supposed to feel like. And so I'm like, yep, that's enough. So you, in the 1970s and, and into the 80s was the time when people did what, what like uh, a Randy Reese or a Greg Troy or a Bob Bowman would call honest work. <laughs> and, uh, that's what they well, call. Yeah, 10,000 10, a session, just about, you know, for honest a whole work. summer, 20, 20, 15, 18 to 20K a day. Do you, do, you, do you have nightmares where you're, you know, about around surrounding practice into your, into your older years? Did you ever have nightmares about, about practices being late for practice or a hard set? No, no? no? I, have, I have, I sometimes have nightmares now where I'm swimming again, but I'm swimming against the guys or I'm on the blocks and my feet won't move off the block. So I don't know what that means, but. Um, I occasionally I'll wake up and go, Oh, I had a swimming dream last night. Doesn't happen often, but, but every once in a while. Is there a, is there, is there a takeaway? There's a, something where you think about swim and you're like, wow, that, that, that I loved it. I love that about what I did. It's just pure love and joy. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No, and but- I think before, my 400 I am in the ready room in LA, Randy, you know, I went up to Randy to talk to him before I went to the ready room and I was expecting the big, you know, rah, rah USA go. And, and he gave me a kiss on the cheek and said, Trace, go have fun. I was kind of like, what? This is the Olympics. And that's what you have to say. But in that moment, I realized that that's why I swam. I loved it. And, and um, it was fun. And uh, the people and the experiences and the friendships are, are the things that, you know, I, I cherish. And, uh, you know, it was a big part of my life and continues to be a little bit of a part of my life and, and is why I'm where I am today. And I'm forever grateful for that. You, you, your times stand up. All these decades later, your times stand up. It's like, you know, if we, if we put you in a tech suit, and we, we put, put you in a silicon cap and, and, an, and an updated pair of goggles. Like, term. We, we, yeah, we, like, rules. And yeah, it's like, it's like, uh, yes, you would be in the hunt. Absolutely. Um, it's like that it all applies. So you have a real insight in, into everything about the sport has to offer. So do you have that, 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 that takeaway advice for kids or for parents or kids mm. who are deep into it now? Wow. Um, I think enjoy it, number one. Um, just always do your best um, and control what you can control. And, and don't worry about the rest. I mean, be an honest competitor, and, but, but you, know, do, you know, do it for yourself. And um, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.